This is the Modern Architect radio show and podcast. The Modern Architect features one-on-one interviews with renowned and cutting-edge architects, influencers, and sustainability leaders. Our show informs and illuminates the transformation that architecture brings to our cities, communities, and lives. And now, introducing the host of The Modern Architect, Tom Dioro. Today, we are joined by Camille Prezwadek a plain air artist in the tradition of Monet. Her aim is to capture the light key of nature, the quality of light on a subject, as determined by various factors such as time of day and atmospheric conditions. Feel free to visit her website as Prezwodek, P-R-Z-E-W-O-D-E-K.com. Today's episode is made possible by Modeler the rapidly growing community for AEC professionals to find and share design inspiration. Created and maintained by architects, join hundreds of thousands of other AEC professionals who are part of the Modeler community. Visit modeler.com and follow Modeler on your favorite social media channels for regular design inspiration. Hello, Camille. We're really honored and excited to have you on The Modern Architect today. Thank you very much for being here. Okay. Hi, Tom. I'm very excited. I love your podcast and some of the guests that you've had on. Thank you very much. And you're now, you are one of our guests as well, Camille. Thank you. Can you share with us, Camille, some of your early inspirations in, uh, as an artist? Well, as a kid, I could always draw. So, um, that was probably the only option for me. I was a really right brained, uh, kid. So the school system really wasn't geared towards me. So when I went to college, I ended up getting into fine art. I mean, I could always draw. Like the kids in the class would always ask me to draw things. So I had a natural ability, but it was undeveloped. So I went to uh, college. I went to um, Wayne State University in the 70s, and I basically learned how to throw paint. There was no real instruction. It wasn't until I met Henry Henchy and... um, Anyway, I started really learning the basic skills that I needed to become a professional artist. You share with us uh, meeting uh, and working with Henry Henshi and how that influenced you and opened up uh, opened up your mind, heart, and everything else to to what it is you do now. Well, I was an illustrator, or I was in the I went to the Academy of Art, and I was majoring in illustration, and I was almost ready to graduate with a portfolio. And my portfolio was very tight, um, rendered, and I met my husband, and he said, you know, I've been painting with this artist back east. Would you like to come and paint with him? Didn't tell me anything about it. It's going to change your life. (laughs) So I went back with him, and I met this artist, Henry Henchy, a master artist. I had never met a master artist, and I was just completely sold and I knew that I wanted to learn from him. I wanted to get what he had to teach me, but I knew it would take me years. So here I am ready to graduate with a portfolio, and I don't want to do anything I had done previously. So I said to my husband, well, thanks a lot. You know, now now I've got to, like, learn this. This is going to take me years. But in in, the end result is that I, when I became an illustrator, I was a fine art illustrator, and my work was so unique that very quickly I got national ads. I did a national ad for Alfa Romeo, for Target, and I was getting into the Illustrator's Annual um, because my work was so unique. Nobody was doing this color work. So it actually ended up helping me in my illustration career. That's really fascinating. Can you share with your audience today how uh, that experience of of, um, doing something that you're not really sure of and and it actually looks daunting, but yet it becomes a breakthrough in your career and life. Well, it's an, I was inspired. <clears throat> I mean, I think that's the key. Like I tell students, don't paint for the marketplace. Just do inspired work, and you eventually will find a market for your paintings. I mean, people want to be around people that are inspired. And uh, for me, there was no question that I wanted to do and uh, follow, you know, Henry Henchy and learn what he was teaching because there was no, there's no color instruction. The only color instruction you can get is maybe somebody that studied with Henry Henchy or somebody that studied with Sergei Bongard. There were two major colorist movements uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, Sergei Bongard was Russian. 
and Henry Henchy was German. Henry was on the East Coast, and uh, Sergei was on the West Coast. And they both valued Hawthorne, and they were the only two movements that were teaching color. And that was during the abstract expressionist period. So Henchy was encouraged to go modern, and if he would have gone modern, the whole the way that uh, Monet was teach was painting would have died, you know, because Henchy was really one of the few people that was carrying on his tradition and actually teaching how to paint the light key of nature, where uh, Monet was just on the forefront. He was doing it, but he wasn't sharing how he was doing it. So it was Hawthorne. Uh, started t Hawthorne was a renowned teacher, and so Sergei was the Russian bravado brushwork, and and Henry was the German, very much into capturing those light keys. Uh, wasn't so expressive, but really his light keys are just amazing. He was doing, I mean, he's he was a master colorist. We're going to touch on two things here. Is one we'll we'll go with the the light key of nature. How does one tap into being that a master or being curious about becoming a master of that light key of nature you i have 35 years of experience so i oh. um it's out going out there having a guide i mean i think it's important to have a guide like i had henshi some students have me i mean i'm just a guide and i give people suggestions but what i say to students i could be lying to you you have to go out there and test what I've taught you. Is it real? You know, am I telling you the truth? And that you've got to explore those light keys. So for instance, on my website, I just got a brand new and improved website, but on my website, I have a uh, pod uh, or a blog, a new blog, uh, Progress Not Perfection. And I have two paintings that I did in, in the 91, 1991, and two paintings that I did recently of the same subject matter, Vineyards and House. It's not even the same painter. In 91, I could only paint sunny days. It wasn't early morning, midday, late. It was just sunny. I didn't know about aerial perspective, you know, that, that haze as you get us. I didn't know anything about gray days, you know, so I was very limited. But over the, you know, time, I've, you know, really spent the time trying to paint those different light keys. And so now that's really what separates me with, from most plenary painters. Because most painters don't even think about light key. Mm -hmm. They think about edges, drawing. So that's my little niche uh, in the plenary. Um, and a, a story I t usually tell people. Um, and I, I have another blog that I talk about painting this uh, gray day light down in San Juan Capistrano. I went into the garden and there was this beautiful silvery light. It was a gray day and I'm thinking, oh, what a beautiful light and I'm ready to set up. And there's artists, oh, I hate this light. There's nothing to paint. I'm like, oh my God, I wanted to sit down and just say this could be beautiful light, you know. But it's harder light to paint. It's harder to see this light. It takes time. You, you know, part of what I'm teaching is it takes the, the you know, going out, and trying to capture the light key of nature, and I'm I'm like a guide. I guide my students um, to to do that. The other one I got, wanted to ask you, Camille, is do inspired work, and you will find a marketplace. Yeah, I mean, I see artists. Uh, they'll have an open studio. They won't sell, so the next open studios are doing little chachkas, you know, just to sell. And what I say is like, maybe you're not going to sell in your first open studio. Just get good work, and then the marketing, then you have to figure out where to put that work. Like if it's in a gallery, like if you have very expressive work and it's in a gallery with rendered pieces, you may not. So I say, don't change your work. Change the gallery or change mm. the venue or maybe, you know, it's like don't change your work for somebody. Like a, like a gallery will say, oh, we love your, your mangoes. They sell. That's a kiss of death for me. You know, I'm not going to paint to the marketplace. Um, and usually a lot of promoters, you know, they don't really understand the artists. They're just into the selling part of it. But um, I just think it's important to paint things that you're inspired by because that's part of your vision. So if you lose your vision and you let somebody else give you your vision, you're going to lose yourself. You're not going to, I mean, you may sell and I see people selling, but I don't think you're going to be very inspired because you're actually painting for somebody else. So I've been very lucky. I've never painted to sell. I've evolved as a painter in my 
collectors have followed with me. There's a certain collector say, oh, we love your older work. It was garish. It was overcolored. You know, there's more finesse. There's more range in my work. And I say to these collectors, well, I got a whole studio filled with old paintings. I, I couldn't even do those paintings anymore. You know, so and you can see in that block the difference in the two, you know, what, what I'm doing today and what I was doing in 91. And it's great for my students. They've said, oh, we really love seeing this, you know, seeing your growth and the struggles that you've had. Fascinating. This is the Modern Architect podcast. We're talking today with Camille Preswadek, a plein air artist in the tradition of Monet. Former more information, feel free to visit our website at preswadek.com. Again, that's P R Z E. W O D E K dot com. Camille, can you share with uh, your audience today what uh, recent um, works that you've done? If you don't mind, you don't have to say who they're with or for, unless you'd like to. Uh, but I'd uh, love to hear you know, what you're most recently working on and with. Well, I've been in the studio. I mean, I've been a plein air artist for years, and most of my work is done outdoors, the majority of it. And uh, in, I think it was 2019, I did a workshop in Cinque Terre, uh, Vernazza. So I did a lot of paintings there, and I took a lot of reference. And what I'm doing now are studio work. So I'm doing a lot of figures on the beach. And so that's my recent series that I'm working on. So in the studio, I can plan a painting more, I can uh, redesign it, and uh, you know, and I work on them longer. They're developed a little bit further. But you need all that experience working on location in order to be able to paint from a photo, because there's really no instruction in a photo. So now I'm doing more studio work and developed painting, more museum quality work. Is that be, uh, because you're, you're inspired to do so, requested to do yeah, so? Yeah, and I want to do more figures, and I want to do more developed paintings, yeah. Yeah. Now, when do, is there a, uh, I don't know if it's a formula, but th th something that strikes you when you go, you know what, this is where I want to go? Well, I write about it. Okay. You know, for instance, in 20, 2006, up to that point, I just painted all the time. I mean, I do four or five paintings a day. I have so many paintings in the studio of these paint. I just paint, 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 paint. <laughs> and it was, uh, I, I had like a, a, a crisis, a personal crisis. And I really started looking internally. I got into therapy and really started thinking about why do you paint? Why do I paint? It's not about just laying paint down. I mean, I needed that experience. But I needed to go much deeper. So it was like I had to find inspiration. What really, it's not just about laying paint down. So I decided I wanted to paint the wetlands. Mm -hmm. um, they would be like my Monet water lilies. They're endangered. So everywhere I went, I painted, you know, uh, I painted the reeds and um, wetlands. I'd go down to Laguna. And I would be in the Laguna Plein Air, and I would be doing the Back Bay. And a lot of my artist friends would say, these don't sell. You know, you should do I'm like, no, I have to do this. So for years, that's all I was doing. So I was re-energized. And then um, I uh, started painting gardens, flowers and gardens. So I had a whole series that I, years that I just painted gardens. So before I paint now, I really write down about what I want to do or what are my goals or what, you know, so I paint smart. I don't necessarily, people say, oh, you probably paint every day. Well, I don't have to do that anymore. I paint smart now. I plan my paintings um, and think about what I'm doing and why I'm doing them. So it's, it's the more, uh, I think they're deeper. I like that. I've not ever heard of that. I paint smart. Can you elaborate a little bit on that paint smart? Well, I think before I just laid paint down. I didn't think about why I was doing it. And, you know, it's like I really had to find a reason or what, ins what was my real inspiration. And it, I think I couldn't have done it before. It's like when I'm painting, it's like playing a musical instrument. People will ask me, well, how did you do that? I have no idea. I have my keyboard. My paints are my keyboard. I put that one color down. Then I relate every color to that first color. And voila, it's either a success or a failure or, you know, whatever. But... I'm not really thinking about it. I'm just playing the instrument. 
where before it wasn't so, na- it didn't come so naturally. I was like still, you know, thinking about each chord and what I was doing and how I was doing it and how, you know, I didn't have the skill or the facility. So once you get the skill in the facility, which is learning how to paint, basically learning the tools, perspective, value, all the tools that you need, like music therapy, you know, like what I say, a lot of uh, students are banging on the, like with paint, they're banging on the canvas and, and hoping to paint, to paint a symphony. It ain't going to happen. You've got to get the skill level before you can do that. So the frustration comes when you, you know, now I can predict the outcome because I have the skills. So then that's out of the way. So then when I just start painting, you know, it just happens. You know, I'm not struggling anymore like I used to because I've got all that, those years of experience. And I'm still growing. You know, I still look at what are my weaknesses, what are my strengths, what do I need to work on? You know, what can I push further? For me, I think I look at artists that grow. If I see an artist growing over the years, those are the artists I look at. There's like very, very well-known artists that have winning formulas and they've been doing the same painting that they were doing 20, 30 years ago. I'm not interested in looking at their work. So that's just one of my, you know, I just like to see growth. I mean, if you've arrived, then you need to kind of shake it up a little bit. That seeing growth and then you you enjoy and you obviously uh, are interested in artists that grow. How do you look for that? How would a, a lay person? No, I just see I just see them over the years. Okay. You know, there's certain artists that people love, and I'm like, they've been doing that for 20 years. You know, it's like, yeah, that's a winning formula. So if you keep repeating the winning formula and you don't see any growth, I mean, they're successful, they're selling. I'm just not interested in look. I saw their work 20 years oh. ago. So I'm wondering what inspires you that you know you keep repeating the same thing. <laughs> And you can really see in that in that uh, blog how much I've grown in 20 years, how much I've changed. I call them my lollipop trees, my older trees. They look like lollipops. How much is your work or even an artist's work in your experience have to do with their own internal personal growth? Oh, yeah. It's all tied in. I mean, for sure. And... What I say to students, I can teach you how to paint, but the hardest part is finding your vision. What separates you from every other plein air artist out there? What is your particular vision? It's what you choose to paint, how you choose to paint it. Is it going to be loose? Is it going to be tight? You know, um, it's going to be textural. Um, You know, there's a lot of factors, but what inspires you? So what I say to students when you're going through magazines, whatever hits you, just clip it because that's a that's a key to who you are as a painter. Not that you're going to paint like that particular artist, but there's something about that artist's work that really inspires you, and that's a key to who you are. I'm pausing only because this really captivated me. Is is whatever inspires you, even if you if it's not what you're doing. There's a reason for that then. You, you just think it's not an accident and it's not just, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you, you got tickled for a moment. The reason why you're drawn to that person or to that work, their work is there is a connection that you're either supposed to replicate mm-hmm. it or be along lines of it or uh, mm-hmm. find your own voice from it. Which you, what, right. Maybe I'm wrong? Yeah. yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, there's a key there. A key. What stops you in your tracks? You know, like people will look at my work and certain people just go by it. And then certain people go, oh, wow, you know, maybe the color they're responding to, maybe they're, you know, whatever. And then try to uh, analyze what it is that that is just just kind of touching you. Mm -hmm. It's like, I think also there could be a painting that is very nicely well executed, but it's not a, it's not a fine art. It's like just a well, you know, then there's a painting that maybe isn't quite as well painted but it's got more soul. Mm. It's like, how do you communicate who you are? How, you know, how are you true to yourself? And I think that's a deeper uh, conversation for an artist. I mean, I think it's important to keep that conversation going with yourself. Why do you paint? You know, who are you? And how, you know, so, and that's, you know, that's hard to do. How to, to keep true to yourself. I mean, for years, I mean, I see like a lot of tonalists and people that are more value painters and I'm drawn to them, but it's like, 
this is my little niche. I've kind of kept in this little groove mm-hmm. and, you know, I identify myself as a plenary colorist in the tradition of Monet. And that's and to keep, to keep in that track has been difficult for me to just, you know, because a lot of times years ago I would go into a gallery and they'd say, Oh, lose your color. It's your, you got two, two, your colors are too bold or um, color. Wasn't that popular. Now color is popular. You know, and so everybody needs color instruction, but there's no color instruction except with the Henchy or the Hawthorne or the Sergei Bonegard people. So it's like people are looking for instruction, but there is no instruction out there. People say, oh, color is individual. Well, yeah, of course it's individual. Like my husband's a painter. If we did the same scene, we would use different colors, but they would be related. So he has his personal, I have, but they're related. And that's what I'm teaching people. Once you put a color down, that's the key to your whole painting. And every every color relates to that first color. I'm getting into, you know, more instruction now. But it is personal, but it also can be taught. Color can be taught. And right now we have the full range of color. So a lot of these really well-known painters are using three colors, four colors, the technology of painting now is that we have the pigments. That's why Rembrandt wasn't a colorist, because he didn't have the pigments. Monet had the pigments. So that's the technology of the painter. So if you're not using the colors, you're not using the technology that we have today. Wow. And that's very controversial. I mean, I've said this. I went to the weekend with the Masters, and um, Dan Pinkham and I, Dan uh, studied with uh, Sergei. I studied with Henchy. And a room full of tonalists, we were talking about, you know, the color, using all the colors. And, you know, it's like four colors. You can't really paint light key with four colors. You can get a good value painting, but you can't get a good color painting. So That's excellent. This is also the modern architect. We're talking today with Camille Preswadek, a plein air artist in the tradition of Monet. Our uh, acknowledgement for public service today is for Oxfam, Oxfam America. The future is here. Oxfam is a global organization that fights inequality to end poverty and injustice. They offer life-saving support in times of crisis and advocate for economic justice, gender equality, and climate action. They demand equal rights and equal treatment so that everyone can thrive, not just survive. For more information, you're welcome to visit their website at Oxfam America. Dot org. Again, we're speaking today. We're honored to be speaking with Camille Priswarik. Camille is <laughs> is the uh, uh, her website is at p r z e w o d e k dot com. That's Priswarik dot com. Camille, with uh, with that technology that you're talking about it in in color, how has that changed insofar as those looking to get to, you know new artists? Did they have an? Uh, do they have an advantage, a disadvantage that went from when you began? Um, well, I, I'm talking about like Monet couldn't do, couldn't have done the paintings that he did without the technology. So we have the colors, and the colors are always improving. Um, so I use 24 colors. Now I don't start a beginning student with 24 colors. We start with the primaries. And then once they learn how to deal with those six colors, then we expand as they expand their vision. So, and it's a commitment uh, for my students to really become a colorist. It takes a lot of time, a lot of uh, experience, and a lot of painting. And you need good instruction, too. So, um, most, like, I'll say things that are the opposite of what they'll hear in other workshops. Like I'll, they'll say, do not, you know, the other, repeat, a, you have to repeat the color. I say, don't repeat the color, you know. Wow. So I'm painting the difference in all the colors. So once I decide, I put a color down, I put an adjacent color next to it, and it's related to that color. I can't repeat the color. I have to paint the difference in these color notes. So I, before I start painting, I think of, What's in light? What's in shadow? So I have to organize my lights and shadows. And then, um, like, this may be too much, but a white in shadow is darker than a black in sunlight. Okay. Wow. 
So you have a, yeah. a value range. You have a 10, 10 being white, one being black. So as you go into the light plane, those black is, would be a six value. So anyway, you're painting the effect of light on objects. So first of all, you think what's in light, what's in shadow. And then you start one color note next to another color note. And, you know, eventually you get really much better at it. The first time you're going to, you know, well, first couple months, you're going to really struggle. But um, it's very different than what other, other artists are teaching. So the other thing is, um, if, you t if you take workshops from all these different painters, and you get all these different instruction, you're going to be confused. So the other thing is for people to decide what they want to learn. You want to learn to be a colorist, or do you want to learn to be a val They're all valid. You know, mm -hmm. you want to be a value painter. So there's certain artists that can help you, but you need to stay with that artist so you develop and you're not going to coming to me and hearing something completely different. So I think a lot of people just take all these workshops and they just end up confusing themselves. So it's like really um, before I, I mean, I take workshops before I take a workshop, I'll like find out, is this person a good teacher? You know, what do I want to learn from that particular teacher? You know, like I won't go to somebody to learn color. I might go to somebody to learn composition or to learn, you know, whatever, design. Um, so, so I tell my students, you know, if you're, if you're really on the colorist path, don't, don't let that, you know, keep that, but maybe go to these other artists to learn other things. But be conscious of what you want from that particular artist. That true to yourself, we're touching back on what you had said uh, earlier in your show, is true to yourself. When did that become really matter to you, If it's unless it's always matter to you, is to be true to yourself? And what does that mean well, to you? Well, I think as an early artist, I didn't think about that. I was just struggling with trying to lay paint down, and I was an abstract expressionist just because I didn't know how to paint. So I was just kind of throwing paint, using palette, experimenting. And I kind of hit a wall. I just didn't have any place to go with it. And in the 70s, the way you promoted was you were good at schmoozing. I mean, that's how, I mean, who you were, schmoozing, and that, that just had no interest for me. So I um, actually stopped painting for about six years. I got into history and political science and spent some time in my left brain, which um, was really good for me. I almost went to uh, Berkeley as a, and majored in history. And then I was looking through an illustrator's annual and I, at my brother's, and I thought, wow, these are some great painters. I want, I'm going to learn a trade, because I had gotten a degree in art, but I had no skill. I couldn't get a job. So then I decided I'm going to go back to school go to the Academy of Art and learn a trade. And uh, eventually, you know, when I became an illustrator, I started having pieces in that same book. So, um, but so, you know, I was learning the color and I think the more, the more I painted and the better I got, the more I started feeling really who, that I was really expressing who I was you know, as an illustrator, you work for clients. And there was a point where I just said to my husband, I, you know, and I was the main earner, I just said, I can't do this anymore. You know, I, I want to paint. So I called my rep in New York. And I said, I don't want any more jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I quit my job one day. Good for you. <laughs> and I said to my husband, I'm going to my new job. I went out, got my easel, and I started painting. An hour into my painting, Somebody came up to me, an attorney in Petaluma. I love your work. I have a Julia Morgan house. How much would you charge to paint my house, a uh, painting of my house? I said, well, you can't art direct me because I just quit my job as an illustrator, but I'll do some little studies. And if you like the studies, uh, 12 by 16 will be 1200 We shook hands, and I made $1,200 in the first day, first hour of my new job. So, yeah. see... I think the universe, it's very California, but I think the universe, when you know what you want, the universe will, it will support you. I was very clear. I wanted to paint. I wanted to paint with all the best plein air painters in the country. You know, I had very specific goals and I 
achieved all those goals, but I was very clear. I just, you know, like if you say, oh, I want to be happy, that's too general. You know, it's like I have, I have many examples of like, I wanted to go to France and that's a whole other story. It, it, the, the, the serendipity of the whole thing was amazing. But, um, so I think you have to plan, you know, you have to know what you want and then go for it. Don't settle. I mean, when I said I wanted to quit my job, everybody around me said, oh, you can't make money with fine art. You're crazy to quit your job as an illustrator. And I just said, get out of my way. I hear that you don't think I can do it, but this is, I know this is the right, and it was the perfect timing. Illustration completely changed. The jobs went away. You know, it was like the perfect time for me to get out of illustration. But see, people don't want to believe, if you're in a dead-end job, you don't want to believe that somebody could actually make money doing something that inspires them. You know, and I say, well, of course you can. You know, but you have to take risks. I mean, quitting my job as an illustrator was a risk. But I could have stayed, you know, done these terrible dead-end jobs, you know, been unhappy but I chose to take another path, which, which was, you know, it was, a, it was really, a, I didn't know what was going to, but I trusted that it was going to, everything was going to fall into place. So, and it did. Camille, I commend you for that. Uh, we're honored by it. And thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you. I really. Oh, thank uh, you. I love your questions in this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you, Camille. It's been a real honor and pleasure having you. You've been listening to The Modern Architect. I'm Tom Dioro. Our guest today has been Camille Prezwadek, a plein air artist in the tradition of Monet. For more information, feel free to visit her website at prezwadek.com. Again, that's P-R-Z-E-W-O-D-E-K.com. Join us again next time when we welcome another outstanding architect, artist, engineer, influencer, or civic leader committed to positive and sustainable cities, communities, and lives. Today's episode is made possible by Modeler, the rapidly growing community for AEC professionals to find and share design inspiration. Created and maintained by architects, join hundreds of thousands of other AEC professionals who are part of the Modeler community. Visit modeler.com and follow Modeler on your favorite social media channels for regular design inspiration.